Well, thank you very much uh, for this um, invitation to speak to you. Thank you for all the organizers. And of course, a Bill's a very dear friend of mine and a fantastic neurosurgeon. And I'm always very proud to hear all of his accomplishments along the way. I'm gonna speak briefly about carotid angioplasty and stenting and just a quick review of the evidence base and its current role and what's happened in our institution and its usage. So to quickly review, the objectives are to review the scientific basis for the use of angioplasty and stenting for symptomatic and asymptomatic carotid disease, to review the influence of operator volume on overall outcome and how we manage our carotid patients. I don't need to tell this audience the primary indications for revascularization, but those are the three broad categories, symptomatic severe extracranial carotid disease, symptomatic moderate, and then of course the asymptomatic disease is much more controversial and with the advent of modern medical therapy, there's been huge advances and it remains a controversial subject. The point of this talk is largely to talk about the evolution and the usage of carotid angioplasty and stenting compared to or in conjunction with the tried and true endarterectomy, which is an outstanding procedure. This audience understands the difference here very well between endarterectomy and angioplasty and stenting. And in the earlier days in our institution between 2000 and 2010, this carotid angioplasty and stenting was reserved largely for high risk patients. Endarterectomy was used for the standard risk patients, but things have evolved very significantly since that time. Historically, as you can see on my slide, symptomatic high-risk patients were going for angioplasty and stent, asymptomatic high-risks, medical therapy or stent, and the standard average carotid patients were still having endarterectomy, and with a very robust science behind that recommendation, principally NASET and some elaborations on the NASET trial. I won't belabor all of the trials and the um, registry data that existed prior to CREST, but there are a number studying a variety of categories of symptomatic and asymptomatic carotid disease. And there were roughly about 12 trials prior to 2010. And it was really on the basis of these trials that if you look at the overall Cochrane review that nicely summarizes them, you see a one to 2% on average increased risk of major stroke or MI or poor outcome with carotid angioplasty and stenting versus endarterectomy. And you can see this is the trend throughout this. And it's on this basis that standard therapy remained endarterectomy in this period of time in North America and certainly in our institution. A lot of discussion during that period of time, however, highlighted some very important points. One of them was the expertise required. Angioplasty and stenting was a young technology at that time a very technical exercise like endarterectomy and required a very significant investment in learning the procedure, not only medical indications, but also the conducting of the actual procedure. Another controversial point was the use of distal protection device, whether it increases, decreases, or overall influences the outcome. And then the last is the measurement of the outcomes themselves what is a major stroke, minor stroke, and, the, and the, basically the evaluation that was so heterogeneous in the different clinical trials prior to CREST. So there was great controversy around those issues. CREST came along and really changed things. Prior to that, the 30-day stroke rate was considered slightly higher for angioplasty and stenting. The mortality was similar. The myocardial infarction and cranial neuropathy was higher with endarterectomy. And then things plateaued after 30 days. And symptomatic stenosis was a little bit higher with stenting, but most of them were asymptomatic. In 2010, the multicenter trial, uh, the lead investigator was brought, published the CREST trial. And I know this audience knows the CREST trial fairly well. Some of you know it extremely well. And basically recruitment wasn't quite as robust as anticipated. So it became a trial of 53% symptomatic patients and the balance were asymptomatics, which was considered a little bit of a dilution of the overall intent of the trial. They studied periprocedural MI, periprocedural stroke, any stroke and death with four year follow-up. And they also cataloged very carefully the influence of operator experience. The, Bottom line from the CREST trial, of which has been greatly studied, a landmark paper similar to NASA, very important, and really, I think a very, very important clinical study is that there's really no real difference between angioplasty and stenting, 
and endarterectomy when one looks at the primary outcomes of stroke, MI, or death. A couple of the highlights that came from it, however, though, that any periprocedural stroke, which typically would be minor, was slightly higher in the angioplasty and stenting at just over 4% and a little bit lower in the endarterectomy. And that rings true in our own experience. Occasionally, we see a small minor stroke which recovers very quickly after angioplasty and stenting, and that made sense to us. But the overall major study outcomes were very, very similar. The last relevant piece is that the myocardial infarction rate was higher with endarterectomy, which also, I think, mirrors real-life experience in our institution. And the interesting portion part about that is if you have an increase of your troponin or you have a myocardial infarction, your survival is slightly less than if you have a minor stroke. So the results from the CRESS trial that they published afterwards with the impact or the influence of MI around stenting was proven to show slightly increased mortality associated with the history of a laboratory or a clinical infarct. Another interesting byproduct was the phenomenon that the younger patients tend to do better with angioplasty and stenting than with the endarterectomy patients. Now, this is in part a function that the older you get, the more tortuous your anatomy becomes and the more atheroma builds up in the blood vessels and therefore you slightly increase your risk of a small embolic event. But it was interesting because it was the type of thing where historically up until this realization, younger patients were being firmly steered toward endarterectomy. But now based on this, it raises the question and the controversy as to whether a younger patient would be better served with a stent. And this is controversial. And by no means do I profess one over the other uh, very strongly in this age category, but it was an interesting observation from the Crest trialists and I found it was worth showing. And, and, and the biological surrogate, I think, of this is that a cut down in the neck of a patient who has increased atheroma burden is probably safer in certain patients than the general access from the femoral artery going above and the potential embolic phenomenon that can occur, which was an interesting clinical observation that the Crest trialists presented. The second major clinical trial, which I think is deserving of substantial weight, is the ACT-1, which was the randomized trial looking at purely asymptomatic carotid stenosis that was published in the New England Journal in March of 2016. This really took the shortcomings of CREST, which was a heterogeneous trial with respect to the asymptomatic population, and looked as a non-inferiority study is angioplasty and stent inferior to endarterectomy for average carotid endarterectomy patients? At this point, it reflects a slightly more mature technology. The trialists and the practitioners are more experienced. It's become more mainstream and not reserved from an experience of simply high risk patients. And I think it's fairly reflective of real life experience and certainly mirrors our experience at the University of Toronto and our institution. And the um, summary from that was that for severe carotid stenosis who were considered average risk of complications, stenting was deemed not to be inferior to endarterectomy with a robust uh, effect of one year and up to five years of follow-up, which I think was an important trial that was conducted for the uh, average risk asymptomatic patient. You can see the Kaplan-Meier analysis freedom from the primary composite event, and it basically proves non-inferiority. And you can see overall, this was seen to be up until five years for all stroke as well as survival. And really, I think was a very good trial to show that in asymptomatic carotid disease, whether you choose to treat it or not is a different issue, but it is not inferior to endarterectomy. So the result of these Two pivotal critical clinical trials, randomized, New England Journal, uh, was that the expansion of angioplasty and stenting not only included the symptomatic high risk and the asymptomatic high risk, but now we expanded this bubble to include it as an alternative and an option offered for your symptomatic standard risk, both symptomatic and asymptomatic for patients less than 80 years of age.
For the patients that are over 80 years, they require an individualized uh, discussion. But I must say, as we've evolved in our technical prowess, some nuances in the development of uh, the angioplasty and stenting techniques, some of those patients are still undergoing angioplasty and stenting, but that's more on a case-by-case -case basis. But the average patient now is offered either endarterectomy, angioplasty, and stenting, and we've had good success. These are the summary of the guidelines that were basically endorsed by multiple societies, including the College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, neurologists, and there's a long list in the uh, bottom of the table here that have endorsed it. And it really captures that the two clinical trials that have been most influential, ACT-1 and CREST, uh, have really shown that there is a scientific basis for non-inferiority of angioplasty and stenting with the potential advantage of a lower MI rate, which improves overall uh, survival, and also a lower um, cranial neuropathy rate. That said, endarterectomy is an excellent procedure, which is very competitive with stenting, and by no means is one clearly um, preferred over the other in the average patient, and I'll speak to that. Some special considerations, I think, when considering an angioplasty and stent are some of them have been mentioned, elderly population, which is really a correlate for tortuosity and high atheroma burden and a variety of medical conditions. A type three arch is more difficult, but the tools are getting so supple and uh, sophisticated that that's less of an issue, tortuosity, calcification. One thing is if you have a thrombus at the site of the plaque, that is dangerous and we tend to heparinize those patients until it is completely um, evaporated or stable. And the last one, which I'll spend a little bit more time on is the effect of experience, both for endarterectomy, clearly a very technical operation, as well as angioplasty and stenting. For endarterectomy, these are largely the patients that were getting the angioplasty and stents from 2000 to 2010, pre-crest, the high risk patients. And we continue to pursue that obviously for those patients who are not suitable for an endarterectomy. The next part of the talk I'll spend three or four minutes on is how much operator experience is required to influence the outcome. So the question is, where is the sweet spot at which the complication rate basically has a plateau effect and does not continue to increase? And I think carotid disease, whether it be endarterectomy or angioplasty and stenting is a perfect example of a highly technical endeavor with substantial risk that really highlights the fact that you need to have significant experience. And I always tell our trainees at the end of the day, I must say, I'm much less fussed about how you do it than how much you do it because that correlates into excellent outcomes. And if you do 100 endarterectomies a year, you're likely to have outstanding results. If you do 100 stents a year, very similarly, but it is a very profound effect of doing a small volume in either direction in which you go. And here's an example from the Medicare beneficiary data of the cross-section of how many procedures typical American and the US practitioners are doing. You can see the annual operator volume is put into these different categories and very few are doing more than 24 a year. And this is based on almost 25,000 angioplasty and stents. The subspecialists include cardiologists, surgeons, radiologists, and you can see here the general trends, a declining trend for the usage of uh, distal protection as well as mortality based on experience. And you can see it here, if you're a very low operator, your 30-day mortality risk is almost twice of what it is as if you're doing over 25 proce 24 procedures uh, per year. So it's very profound and very clear. This is an Austrian study. Here's another example of a study uh, from Houston. And you can see the curve plateaus around the 75 mark. So imagine you have to have done 75 carotid angioplasty and stents before you can flatten your curve of complication. That's a substantial amount in this day and age, particularly when the medical therapy is so good. This is the CREST data. You can see in the first 2000 to 2005, the complication rate of death or major stroke was substantially higher than in the second epoch from 2006 to 2008. So does operator experience influence outcome for endarterectomy or angioplasty and stent, which I use in this example? Absolutely, and the number's around 75. It applies to many procedural things that have a certain amount of complexity.
how do we get over these kind of issues of uh, trying to have a volume that makes our complication rate at the lowest possible, rigorous credentialing, simulation centers, virtual training, proficiency-based curricula, and the identification of centers of excellence. So I think in general, a more valid question is not, are you gonna have an endarterectomy or are you gonna have an angioplasty in stent, but perhaps is, has your practitioner done a satisfactory volume of either procedure to minimize the complication rate? And that's fairly well studied. And we know the airline industry is a very good uh, model for simulation training, which is increasingly occurring at our institution. Last couple of minutes, I'd like just to mention how we triage our carotid patients because the other very important thing, which is almost more important than the modality you choose, is time to treatment. We established a website called the Acute Carotid Clinic, which is a virtual clinic where practitioners can email in, they log on, they give a very short thumbnail referral. We all receive an email. Our assistant will uh, correspond electronically with our uh, referring doctor within 24 hours, and usually the patient's seen within 24 to 48 hours. At that point, they're triaged, imaged and triaged for revascularization. And I'll be honest, we've evolved into such a way that most of them are going for angioplasty and stenting because of the seduction of minimally invasive procedures. The next issue is CREST 2, and we are participating in CREST 2, and it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. And the last issue as it relates to angioplasty and stenting is with the acute ischemic strokes and the EVT procedures, this is a paper we published, we're doing more and more crossing occluded vessels and sometimes you have to leave a stent behind. It also highlights the importance and the advantage of when you're doing a stent, you can see all the blood vessels in the brain, whereas in the end endarterectomy, you can't. It doesn't mean that you choose one over the other, but if you were to quote advantages and disadvantages, at the end of the procedure, you can see if there's been any embolic sequelae of your intervention. Just leave you with some typical cases that we would be considering here. This would be an average patient, symptomatic, and they would have a calcified but fairly standard plaque. We would see the patient in the clinic. We would offer them endarterectomy or angioplasty and stenting. We would divulge that we do much more minimally invasive work now, and our volume is much higher in that world. And most patients, while they're aware of the alternative, they would choose an angioplasty and stent, and the results have been very good. This would be a patient who would be considered high risk, who we probably would not recommend an endarterectomy. Uh, due to a high lesion and requiring a little bit more elaborate surgical procedures uh, to do, and they would have an angioplasty stent, and this patient had that, and there were no issues. Tight stenosis, sometimes we have to cross with a leading wire and then do an exchange, but we always try and still use distal protection, and our go-to stent is a protege stent, and we use distal protection with the angioguard in the vast majority of cases. Occasionally, we have to use a BMW wire to dock, to cross, and give it a little bit of a nudge before, but most of the time, it's straightforward. And this one would be a high-risk patient with a history of radiation. The last one that's evolved that I think is a nuance that we've changed our practice is a soft or a fatty plaque. And the soft fatty plaque and endarterectomy is a discussion, perhaps a little bit more prominent, but also we would use a cello proximal guide, inflate the balloon and do suction at the time of um, dilatation just to minimize the risk because we think that this lesion probably carries a slightly higher risk of embolic sequelae. And this is a special consideration. It's not always so easy to pick up a fatty plaque. So in summary, I think what I've shown you is the evolution of carotid angioplasty and stenting in our institution, the fact that operator volume is probably more important than the modality you choose, uh, but volume is extremely important for outcome and how we do it at our place and how we rapidly triage our acute carotid patients. So thank you very, very much for your attention. I'm very honored to give this 